bolstering bonds. Putin and Xi praise China-Russia partnership, highlighting its growing membership and role as a stabilizing force against a Western influence. Britain decides. Britain's early general election sees Labour on the brink of a historic victory, poised to end 15 years of conservative dominance. Biden steady. White House affirms Biden will firmly stay in the race amid 2024 election jitters, quelling Democratic doubts after a shaky debate performance. And champions reborn. Italians regain confidence and mobility through horse therapy after accidents at Rome's unique San Giovanni Battista Hospital. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us tonight on World News. We've got a number of key stories to update you on today and we start with updates on the diplomatic front with Russia and China. Russian President Vladimir Putin hailed relations with China, saying they're at their best period in history as he met with the Chinese leader Xi Jinping yesterday on the sidelines of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in Kazakhstan. Both Putin and Xi praised the group, which includes Central Asian countries, as well as India, Iran and Pakistan, for its expanding membership and emphasized stable Sino-Russian relations amidst regional tensions. Putin also said those relations are not aimed against anyone, adding that both countries are acting in the interests of our peoples. The SCO, a regional security bloc founded by Russia and China 20-some 20 years ago, is also set to welcome Belarus as a new member of the organization on Thursday. This year's two-day summit in Kazakh capital Astana, titled Strengthening Multilateral Dialogue, has security and stability at the top of the agenda. In a decisive point for the Conservative Party, the gamble taken by UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak seems to be backfiring tonight as exit polls suggest that in a historic move, the Labour will garner power in a massive way. This is after the snap polls were called, seeking a fresh mandate from the British people who voted today. 40,000 polling stations opened across Britain on Thursday as voters made their choice in a parliamentary election expected to bring Keir Starmer's Labour Party to power. Pollsters predict Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's Conservatives will be swept away after 14 often turbulent years. Sunak cast his vote early in his Northern English constituency alongside his wife. Opinion polls put Starmer's centre-left party on course for a landslide victory. 61-year-old Starmer also arriving at a London polling station with his wife to cast his ballot. In a statement, Starmer, the former chief prosecutor of England and Wales, said today Britain can bring a new chapter. Thank you. Quite right. Reform UK leader Nigel Farage soaked up the sun on a walkabout in his constituency of Clacton-on-Sea. <laughs> Liberal Democrat party leader Ed Davey arrived at a local church to cast his vote. Voters on London streets had mixed emotions. I feel like every candidate's pretty awful in all honesty. If I was going to vote for anyone, I'd vote for Labour, but I don't think any of them are particularly good choices. I'm optimistic. I think it's been a pretty dreadful 10, 12, 14 years, so pretty optimistic. Voting ends at 10pm when an exit poll will give the first indication of the outcome. Official results are expected in the early hours of Friday. All right, let's get some reaction to the latest story on what's happening in the United Kingdom. And for that, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent, Nalin Pereira, who is standing by in London with the latest. Nalin. Yes, Anurad, it seems Labour are on course for a landslide victory with a majority of 212 seats according to the final Yuga poll projections of this campaign. This will give Sir Keir Starmer the biggest majority of any single party since 1832 in a vote which Yuga's last MRP suggests that will break series of electoral records. Some of the biggest names in Conservative politics would lose their seats under this projection, including 16 of the 26 cabinet ministers still standing, including Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. 
according to YouGov. Labour are set to win 431 seats, the highest number of parties in history, and it will pass the previous peak of 419 reached by Tony Blair in 1997, making Keir Starmer the most successful Labour leader in history in terms of electoral successes. Meanwhile, the Tories are on course for 102 seats, substantially down on the 165 achieved in 1997 under John Major, losing more than two-thirds of the 365 elected under Boris Johnson in 2019. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much for the update. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Nalin Pereira from London in the UK. Well, with the numbers projecting a steady cruise for Starmer's Labour while the Tories fall behind, the public opinion too reflects the same, it seems. For an insight into reactions of voters in the course of the polls, we have with us other than a World News special correspondent, Pawani Sinhara Mudlige from Essex in the UK. What do you have for us, Pawani? Yes, Anuradhi. Polling stations opened across the UK with some of the first voters to arrive lending their support to the ruling Conservative Party. Britain looks set to elect Labour Party, leading Keir Starmer as its next Prime Minister. So if in Rishi Sunak's Conservatives are out of office after 14 of 10 turbulent years. Opinion polls put Starmer's centre-left party on course for a landslide slide victory as voters turn their backs on the Conservatives following a period of infighting and turmoil that led to five Prime Ministers in eight years. Despite the tax forward policies suggested by the Labour Party, the Conservatives have struggled to garner support leading up to the opening polls today, mainly due to their ailing economy and inaction key issues such as the Russia Ukraine war. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Pawani Senhara Mudilige from Essex in the UK. India's Foreign Minister Jai Shankar and China's Wang Yi agreed in Kazakhstan to intensify border talks. India-China relations have been strained since a 2020 military clash along their poorly demarcated Himalayan border, resulting in fatalities on both sides. In 2020, border clashes between India and China resulted in the deaths of at least 20 Indian soldiers and an unknown number of Chinese soldiers. Both nations have since increased their military presence along the disputed 3,488-kilometer border. Despite 21 rounds of military diplomatic talks, progress has been slow. China has expressed a desire for stable relations with recent statements emphasizing proper handling of border disputes. Both foreign ministers agreed that prolonged border tension is detrimental and called for efforts to disengage troops from the conflict areas. Heading over to East Asia now, Chinese officials seized a Taiwanese fishing boat near a Taiwan-controlled island, escalating already high tensions. Taiwan's Coast Guard reported the incident. China, which considers Taiwan its territory, has increased pressure on Taipei since President Lai ching tae labelled a separatist took office in May. Taiwan's Coast Guard on Wednesday asked China to release a Taiwanese fishing boat and its five crew members detained by Chinese Coast Guard late on Tuesday night. According to the spokesperson of the China's Coast Guard, the fishing vessel violated the fishing moratorium regulations and trawled illegally within the prohibited area, leading to the seizure of the Taiwanese boat, which is now being held at Waito, a port in southeast China. The fishing boat Tachin Man 88, with two Taiwanese and three Indonesian crew members, has also been accused of damaging marine fishery resources and operating during China's annual summertime fishing ban from May to August. The Taiwan Coast Guard Administration said it dispatched three vessels to rescue the fishing boat soon after it was intercepted, but was blocked by multiple Chinese boats and told not to interfere. Chinese authorities have seized and detained 17 Taiwan registered ships since 2003 for fishing during the summertime ban. A new update to the ongoing war now. Lebanese militant group Hezbollah has responded to the killing of one of its senior commanders by Israel with a rocket attack against its neighbor. Tel Aviv is also reviewing Hamas's response to a ceasefire proposal that mediators shared with the Palestinian militants. Hezbollah says it fired 100 rockets at Israel in response to the killing of one of its senior commanders. 
The Lebanese militant group said through a statement on Wednesday that Mohammed Nima Nasser had been killed in an Israeli strike in southern Lebanon, later adding that it launched 100 Katusha rockets at an Israeli military base and another attack near the border. According to the Israeli military, most of the rockets fell in open areas without causing any injuries. Israel identified Nasser as the commander of a unit that operated from southwestern Lebanon, which was responsible for firing attacks into Israel. Sources indicate that Nasser held a similar rank to Taleb Abdallah, a senior commander killed by an Israeli strike in June. That attack prompted Hezbollah to launch some 200 rockets at Israel, the largest rocket attack since the conflict in Gaza began on October 7th. Another of Hezbollah's top commanders was killed by Israel in January. Also on Wednesday, the Israeli government said it is reviewing Hamas's response to an Israeli proposal, which included the release of hostages and a ceasefire. Israel's intelligence service confirmed on Wednesday that mediators in Qatar and Egypt had submitted Hamas's response to Israel. Hamas also confirmed that one of the group's leaders had engaged with mediators positively, but demanded a deal that includes a complete ceasefire. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. And on the road to the White House tonight, the White House has denied a media report claiming President Biden is reconsidering his re-election bid. The report, based on an unnamed ally, suggested Biden felt the need to reassure the public about his capabilities. A report by the New York Times Wednesday led to a wave of speculation that U.S. President Joe Biden was considering dropping out of running for a second term. Headlined. Biden told Ally that he is weighing whether to continue in the race. It seemed as if Biden was unsure if he could carry on after his subpar performance during a televised debate with Donald Trump. The article, however, was misleading, with no reference to Biden explicitly saying he would not run again. Rather, the report was based on a conversation between Biden and an unnamed key ally, who was quoted as saying that the president knew he needed to quickly reassure the public he can still do the job. That did not stop the speculation, leading the White House to reiterate that the president is still working towards his goal of staying in office for another four years. I can say is the president is moving forward. He's moving forward as being president. He's moving forward uh, with his campaign, as his campaign has been very, very clear about that. That's what I can. That's what I can speak to, and that's what I can say. And that is the president's focus. The president's focus is how does he continue to do that work, and anything else that. We're we're hearing or that's being reported is absolutely false. However, pressure continues within the Democratic Party as another Democrat lawmaker called on Biden to resign. Speaking to the New York Times in an interview, Congressman Raul Grijalva, who represents Arizona, said he would support Biden if he remains at the top of the ticket, but said he believes the party should select a new nominee. The remarks come just one day after Lloyd Doggett became the first sitting Democrat lawmaker to call on Biden to withdraw from the race. An opinion poll conducted by the New York Times and Siena College also showed Trump's approval rating widening after last week's debate. Among likely voters, 49 percent said they would vote for Trump, as opposed to 43 percent of respondents who said they would still vote for Biden. This marks a three percentage point upswing for Trump from a week earlier. Additionally, among registered voters, 49 percent said they would vote for the former president, while 41 percent said they would vote for the incumbent. 74 percent of respondents also said that Biden is too old for the job, up five percentage points since the debate. Hurricane Beryl struck Jamaica with deadly winds and rain, killing one and raising the death toll to at least 10 across the Caribbean. The Category 4 hurricane left a path of destruction with numbers expected to rise as communications improve. Hurricane Beryl slammed into Jamaica Wednesday as a powerful Category 4 storm after causing major destruction over smaller Caribbean islands over the past couple of days. Power outages were widespread across Jamaica, while some roads near the coast were washed out. 
Authorities say at least 10 people have died, and the tally is likely to increase as communications come back across the islands. Director of the National Hurricane Center, Michael Brennan. So very dangerous conditions ongoing now in Jamaica, and they are going to continue for the next several hours. Every barrel is centered about uh, 265 miles to the east-southeast of Grand Cayman, so the Cayman Islands are sort of next in line for seeing significant impacts. And again, barrels moving west-northwest pretty quickly at about 18 miles per hour. The loss of life and damage wrought by Burl underscore the consequences of a warmer Atlantic Ocean, which scientists cite as a telltale sign of human-caused climate change fueling more extreme weather. Phone footage shot in Grenada showed destroyed houses and debris from Hurricane Burl. The Prime Minister of Grenada said there was almost complete destruction of the electrical grid on one of the country's islands, Cariacu. Burl is the 2024 Atlantic season's first hurricane and the earliest storm on record to reach a Category 5. Further west, in Mexico's tourist epicenter of Cancun, an environmental agency worked to gather eggs from sea turtles' nests for their protection, as the city and the wider Yucatan Peninsula lies in Burl's protected path. Cancun's airport was flooded with tourists, hoping to catch last flights out before the storm arrives. Mexico's defense ministry has opened around 120 storm shelters and asked visitors to follow instructions from authorities in case they were ordered to go to designated shelters. The severe weather continues now. A look at the western U.S. Authorities in Northern California have ordered evacuations due to the Thompson and Toll fires, which have burned over 3,000 acres. The Thompson fire, currently under investigation, has wreaked havoc on structures fueled by low humidity, gusty winds and a relentless heat wave that intensifies the fire's fury. The quick-moving Thompson fire near Oroville, raging in Northern California. More than 3,500 acres scorched so far with 0% containment. Cars, homes, and structures reduced to rubble. The inferno forcing nearly 30,000 residents from their homes, as more than 1,400 personnel worked around the clock to extinguish the flames. That massive blaze fueled by dry, windy conditions coupled with a crippling heat wave. At least eight firefighters injured. It comes as dangerously high temperatures tighten their grip on the West. That heat taking the life of a 10-year-old boy in Phoenix on Tuesday after he had to be airlifted off a hiking trail. Temperatures that day soaring to 110 degrees. And now an update on the ongoing Kenyan protests. Protesters in Kenya continue to demand President Ruto's resignation over a controversial finance bill raising living costs. Demonstrations including tear gas and bonfires have intensified. Businesses are closed, highways are blocked and vehicles have been burned amid fears of escalating unrest. Chaos continuing on the streets of Nairobi, Kenya. Police clashing with demonstrators firing tear gas, hitting people with batons, and tossing others in the backs of police vehicles. One man dressed in civilian clothes firing off a gun on a sidewalk. The protest in Nairobi began because of a specific bill that would have raised taxes. Kenya's president, William Ruto, abandoned plans for the tax hike a day after the unpopular bill passed. But for many people, that was not enough. For Kenyans protesting, the bill was a symptom of more systemic economic concerns. And now they want the president to step down. Their frustrations heightened after days of violent and deadly clashes with police. The Kenya National Human Rights Commission says at least 39 protesters have been killed, and at least 24 of those were at the hands of police, according to a joint statement released by Amnesty Kenya. And more than 360 have been injured in what the Human Rights Commission describes as an excessive and disproportionate response. The president cited a lower figure of 19 people killed, and he defended his decision to call in the security forces to respond to what he says are criminals. I have no blood on my hands. As a democracy, that should not be part of our conversation. 2.4 billion of property has been destroyed. 
but protesters are refusing to back down. Stop and stop killing us! They say this fight is about their most basic right. We're going in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Over in Rome, horses and ponies at San Giovanni Battista Hospital help neurological patients regain movement and also their confidence. With special saddles, patients take their first steps post-trauma, strokes and long COVID with the help of these horses. Matteo Santo Padre braces himself before grabbing onto the saddle of a horse, his four-legged nurse for the day. The former shooting champion relies on a wheelchair after a month-long coma following a car accident. He comes here to the San Giovanni Battista Hospital on the outskirts of Rome for therapy with horses, where he says the animals give him confidence. The hospital, which is in an area that used to host horse races, is the only one of its kind in Italy. The therapy horses help some neurological patients take their first steps after trauma, strokes, degenerative diseases, as well as long COVID. The patients can perform movements that would be harder to do in a regular gym, as they work on muscle strength, balance, and coordination. Grande. The emotional bond with the horses helps too. The hospital's program operates alongside traditional rehabilitation. It involves both horses and ponies, and in 2023, it had more than 600 patients. And that concludes our world news coverage for tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more key global updates. Stay tuned for the nightly business report with Sina Mayadini. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night. <laughs>